You guys ever watch that show, uh, How It's Made, on the Discovery Channel? I love that show. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was watching it, and they were talking about, I can remember exactly the three things they were doing that night. It was hot dogs. <laughs> you guys ever watch how they make hot dogs? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> D disturbing. But anyway, they did hot dogs and toothpicks. Toothpicks was cool. They, they brought in these huge logs on one end of this factory. And then on the other end of the factory, these little itty bitty toothpicks come out, which was really cool. And the other thing they did was hot tubs. And it showed how they actually poured, um, you know, blew in the fiberglass and then how they used all the different, yeah, and how they cut everything and made it. It was really cool. But after that show was over, uh, same channel, I started watching a show about this foundry. And basically it was this metal plant. And they dealt with all different kinds of metals. Uh, and they would bring them in and then based on what their clients wanted, uh, they would melt these metals down and then they would purify them and they would make them into any number of different things. So they had all these different levels of skilled metal craftsmen working at this facility. So it was just really cool to see the processes of how they went through all this. Uh, but the first thing that they always did was they always wanted to find the melting point of these metals. And that was, I just, I'm kind of nerdy. I think this stuff's cool. But you guys know what the melting point for lead is? 180, you guys are all over the place, man. So, <laughs> but 621 degrees. I was actually surprised. I thought it would be higher than that. What about steel? Everybody's scared now. Yeah. 2,750 degrees. Yeah. Tungsten, this ring I have on my finger. 6,150 degrees, which says I'm sitting there watching this, I'm wondering, if I ever have this thing like cut off my finger, <laughs> what, what are they going to do with that exactly? But anyway, 6,150 degrees, I just thought that was cool. Um, but the first thing that they do when they, they heat these metals up, they get them to a liquid form, and they want to get them to that liquid form because what that does is a lot of these metals, when they come in, they're not pure, right? They're kind of a, in an ore type formation, but as they heat it up, the impurities will float up to the top and it, you can actually see it. It's like this orange metals and you can see these gray spots. Uh, and then the skilled craftsman will go in and kind of skim those impurities off of the top. And then from there they take these metals, and this is my favorite part, I love watching them do this. It's like hot molten saltwater taffy where they get those like huge super duper oven mitts and they actually can act, grab it and like shape it in different things and hit it with hammers and make it into all these different cool things. I don't know. I just love that stuff. But anyway, so it reminded me also of something that I've heard Woody say uh, several times and that is in the same way that metals have to be heated up so that the impurities can rise to the surface and be skimmed off by a master craftsman and in the same way that those metals have to be heated up so that they can be shaped into something different something beautiful by the master craftsman the same thing is basically true of our own lives the same thing is true of us in our relationships with other people the same thing is true in our relationships with God and the same thing is just true in our lives um, and as I was watching that show, I was thinking back to, for myself, that's true. Most of the, the times when I've really made huge steps towards God, or most of the times where I've had, I guess you would say, epiphanies about my own life, uh, they've been at times when I've been in the fire. They've been at times when the temperature was rising, the pressure was on, and in those moments, uh, I made huge moves towards God. And for a lot of us even, we probably when we stop and think about it, that was how God found us. For a lot of us, we were in, we were in the fire when God found us. Um, Jesus Christ said that in this world we will have troubles. And he was right. In this world we will have troubles. That is one thing I can guarantee you. Um, but what I've found is for me, whenever I go into the fire, and so basically we're all going to go into the fire at one point or another. Whenever I go into the fire, I take one of two approaches <clears throat> when I look back over my life. The first approach is I'll have a tendency to focus on the fire itself. And I'll know this because there'll be a lot of moaning and groaning. Uh, I'm focusing on how painful this is, how unfair this is, um, you know, how uncomfortable this is. I'll be focused on the fire. But there's another approach, too, that I've been able to do sometimes, and I'll be completely honest, it's typically only through community that I've, ever <laughs> I've ever been able to pull this off. Um, but I'm actually able to focus on not so much the fire, but to focus on the dross. That is, what are the impurities that are rising to the surface in me? What, are the, what is bubbling to the surface in me that doesn't seem to be coming from God? 
I'm also able to stop and focus on, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? What are you trying to shape me as through this? Um, and all of us, whenever we go into the fire, and we are all going to go into the fire, we all make that decision. God gives us the ability to make that decision. It's that whole free will thing keeps showing up over and over again that gets us all into a lot of trouble. But we all have that decision to make. And I was thinking, one of the first times for me when I actually encountered that was very soon after I became a Christ follower. And before I tell this story, um, I have to make a little editor's note, uh, but it's talking about my wife, um, because when I came to Christ first, but I also want to say that my wife since then, not only has she come to Christ, but most of the time she's completely wearing me out because I'm trying to keep up with her, basically. She is right now running towards God at 110 miles an hour, and I'm just trying to hold on to her and uh, keep up with her. But I did come to Christ first, and <clears throat> at that period, you know, before that, there was a lot of just insanity associated with my life, uh, drinking, alcohol, basically. I'd, and she, she made this point. Everything I did, I did at 110 miles an hour. If I was going to party, I was going to party at 110 miles an hour. If I was going to run a business, I was going to run a business at 110 miles an hour. Uh, so when I first started, when I gave my life to Christ, and I told her that, she was happy about that. And I think she was thinking, and I see this in a lot of other guys, too. At first, she was thinking, good, he's going to get his act together. But then when I actually started to see how much time it was taking, uh, when she started to see the, the changes that it was actually making in our life so far as the, th the places that I would go and the, the people that I would engage with, it really started to affect our lifestyle. At that point, she started to give a little bit of resistance. Uh, and there started to be conflict in our relationship. Uh, and I found myself in the fire. I found myself with the temperature rising and the pressure increasing. Um, but at that point, because thankfully I was around some guys who were also walking with me at this time and, and pointing these areas out to me, I also started to notice some of that dross, some of that imperfection, some of the impurities that were floating up to the surface for me. And the first one I noticed was uh, love. I was loving her on the basis of what I thought she deserved. So that is, she was stressing me out at the time, so I wasn't loving her. I didn't feel like she deserved it. So I kind of withdrew my love from her. Um, Another one was the idea of trying to fix her. Just if you guys are planning on that, don't do it. I'll just, I'll just tell you right now that it doesn't work. But I thought maybe, you know, if I tried harder, maybe if I tried to, you know, rationalize this with her or have these discussions with her, that maybe I could change her in some way. So I tried, I tried to, to fix her. That, was, that didn't work. Uh, I ended up making things worse. <laughs> And uh, the other thing was, I had this fear of this idea that, what if these two relationships never mesh? What if I never get to the point where I can have a, a healthy relationship with my wife and a healthy relationship with God? I would love to have both, but I had this fear of, what if that never happens? What if I can never get to that point? Uh, so that was the dross for me that was popping up, that the fear, um, the, the unconditional love, uh, all this stuff was popping up to the top. Uh, that this dross that started to come off to the top. So I started praying to God, God, skim that off the top and show me what, what, show me what it is that you want me to see from this. And I also had my brothers praying with me on this as well and, and giving me insight into it as well. And what God showed me was um, my love for my wife has to be unconditional. It's, it's not based on... Uh, my love for my wife is unconditional in the same way that Jesus Christ's love was unconditional for me. If Jesus had loved me for what I deserved... I wouldn't be here right now. 